right now, tell me a story. Would you have one ready to go? We spend our whole lives collecting stories, reading them, watching them, living them, but we spend less and less time telling them. We don't talk to each other like we used to. We don't play with language and teach each other lessons that we've learned. Mostly we type, and we do have conversations, but they're less big picture and more little screen. We've all heard about oral storytelling traditions, sitting around a campfire, you know, people passing down knowledge from generation to generation. But what role does storytelling play in our modern world? I actually ended up finding a study that was published really recently in a journal called Nature Communications, and it focused on modern-day hunter-gatherer societies and the role that storytelling plays within them. This study focused on groups of people in the mountainous regions of the Philippines. These people are called the Agta. And in this study, each participant was given rice tokens. They had the option of keeping them for themselves or giving them away. The more storytellers there were in a group, the more likely people were to give their rice tokens away. Perhaps that's because of the 89 stories the researchers heard while they were doing this study. 70% of them focused around themes of social norms, behavioral expectations, and cooperation. So there's definitely benefits to storytelling for groups, but what about for the storytellers themselves? people were more than twice as likely to want to live with good storytellers than anyone else. This was true even when they could have chosen hunters or foragers. Something about storytelling is more valuable than even your next meal. And it didn't stop there. Storytellers were more likely to find a mate, to produce healthy offspring, and to be given resources from other members of their group, like those rice tokens. So that's all well and good for our hunter-gatherer societies, but what about for you and I? I truly think that the real value storytelling holds today is the ability to foster face-to-face -face human connections in a world that is desperate for it. It also is a way to pass down knowledge and share it with each other what we've learned. And I don't think it's enough to merely hear stories. I think we need to preserve the art of telling stories of our own. With that said, in the interest of show and tell, I'm gonna tell you two stories today. And I'm gonna jump right in. I'll start with a short one that goes a little something like this. When my grandfather was five years old, his mom asked him to buy some ice from the ice truck that would drive up and down the streets of Woodstock, Ontario. In 1940, most people didn't have a freezer of their own. It was early in the morning, breakfast time, and my grandpa was hungry, he wanted to eat. But his mom said, no, no, hurry up, you'll miss it. So he left the house, and he walked down the driveway, and he darted out onto the road. He didn't look both ways. He was knocked down and run over by a car, not just once, but twice, with the rear tire too, right across his belly. My grandfather survived because of two simple coincidental miracles. The tires had missed his ribs, which surely would have punctured his lungs if they'd been cracked. But my favorite part is that my grandfather survived because his mom hadn't let him pause for breakfast. A full stomach would have burst under the tires, but my grandfather's was empty. So that's a little warm-up story, just a short one for you, but I want to take you now behind the scenes and tell you the story behind that story, how I learned it in the first place. And it's a little bit closer to spoken word poetry, which is a passion of mine, so I really hope you enjoy it. It was at my grandfather's house where I first fell in love with collective nouns for birds. A fling of sparrows, a crown of kingfishers, an unkindness of ravens. As if these are proper words, these whimsical syllables we've chosen to describe groups of birds. My grandfather lived out in the woods, acres and acres of open and forested land for exploring, for observing a trembling of finches, a wisdom of owls, or a kettle of swallows. My grandfather's name was Douglas McLeod Simons, and he was born in 1935. He taught me all kinds of new words and helped me redefine words I thought I already knew. It's not 
very unique, he told me once. It's just unique. Something can't be very one of a kind. I've never forgotten that. My grandfather is older now, and he's losing his words. And I waited too long to ask him for more of them, to ask him what it had been like to publish four books about the township he was born in, about where he found inspiration for his weekly newspaper column called Simon Says that ran for 25 years, and when he decided he wanted to become a writer. Because I knew when I wanted to become a writer, from the moment at age four when I grabbed some loose sheets of paper and stapled them together and called them my book. And so I asked my dad, when did Grandpa decide he wanted to become a writer? And my dad replied with the last thing I expected him to say. Oh, he said, he didn't. He didn't? He didn't. He wasn't a writer. He worked at a moving company most of his life. I was stunned. Who was this non-writing grandfather of mine? But I did a bit of digging and I found out more. My grandfather had taken a creative writing course at the age of 54 at Western University as a hobby. And the writing just sort of happened after that. My dad had no stories for me about my grandfather, the writer. Oh, but he had stories about the time my grandfather was run over by a car twice and only survived because his belly was empty about how my grandpa fell in love with my grandma across a train car, no words exchanged, just one long look, and he knew he would marry her, and he did. I felt like I knew my grandfather better after hearing these stories, even if not everyone saw him as the writer I did, the writer I knew he was. He was the one who taught me to grab fleeting moments of inspiration and wrestle them down onto the page the one who secured me my first published writing gig, a column about horses in the Old Stage Road newsletter, which is the name of the long winding dirt road he lived on. It was the road where I saw my first charm of hummingbirds, my only exultation of larks, and my favorite descent of woodpeckers. To most people, my grandpa is a family man, a volunteer, a mover maybe, but to me, he is a writer. To me, he is a storyteller. All right, so those are two stories. Were they any good? Who knows? But they're mine, and they're my family's, and I'm going to use them as a tool to share seven really quick tips for how you can become better at telling stories of your own. Number one, have some stories ready. What if someone said to you what I did at the top of this talk? Tell me a story. Have a few ready on a few different themes in case the opportunity arises, and trust me, it will. Number two, revolve your story around a feeling. Try for just one and use it to set the tone for your story. The feeling I tried to evoke in my first story was kismet, the universe working out just as it should. And the second story was all about nostalgia, that sort of glossy, shiny quality life gets when you're looking back on things fondly. Whatever you're feeling, stick with one and use it for every aspect of your telling. Number three, don't be boring. That one sounds a lot easier than it is. Don't introduce too many characters because they become really hard to keep track of, but do include interesting anecdotes and unique details like dates and times and vivid descriptions that give your story color and depth. Number four, whip out your trivia. If you've got some random factoids or tidbits, don't be afraid to weave them into your narrative if you can. Even if people aren't interested in your overall story, perhaps they'll still learn something. So even if you take nothing else from today, maybe you learned that it's called a fling of sparrow. Number five, be mindful of weak attention spans. It is sad, but it's true, and it does vary, but in social contexts, the best stories are about two to five minutes long. Any more than that and you'll have people looking at their phones. But you can hook people's attention by using creative word choices. So maybe someone ran, but perhaps they sprinted. Maybe they tumbled or they darted like my grandfather did out onto the road. Number six, be vulnerable. If you have a crazy or intimate or hilarious story, don't be afraid to share those details. We as humans are desperate for connection, and when other people are willing to be vulnerable with us, 
it really resonates. So don't be afraid to take that risk. And number seven, have a moral to your story. There's a reason why Aesop's fables were passed down for generations. They taught us lessons. They illustrated things that were deeply human. The moral of both of my stories was to enjoy the fragile, fleeting beauty of life and the people within it. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but I think a story is worth a thousand pictures. Learn to paint with your words and you will have a captive audience for life. Whether it's in marketing or networking or your own personal relationships, be the good storyteller in the group. You'll get so many more treats and potential mates that way after all. Thank you. Thank you.